Welcome to The World This Week. What's going to happen this week? William Shabas is a Canadian expert on international criminal and human rights law, and he was appointed to lead the UN investigation on Gaza. He joins us now from London. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shabas. Hello. Now, what issues will you investigate? Well, we have a, a mandate that asks us to, or that charges us to investigate um, violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law um, that were committed on the occupied territory, uh, particularly Gaza, like the, um, the military activities in Gaza, the targeting, the proportionality, and so on. And what about the Hamas uh, activities as well? Well, I think that if one, if a reasonable person reads the mandate we've been given by the uh, Human Rights Council, that it's clear that violations of international humanitarian law by all participants in the conflict would be covered. Israel's Prime Minister's initial comment was the UN should visit Damascus, Baghdad and Tripoli first. Uh, you know, where have the UN been when over 100,000 people were killed in Syria and still are? Well, the, the UN, of course, does have a commission of inquiry dealing with Syria. And uh, the UN, again, it depends on which part of the UN we're talking about. But there have been huge concerns within the UN about Syria. Syria, of course, is also caught in some of the double standards that prevail within the international system and in the United Nations. But I, I don't think one should suggest that the UN has been indifferent to Syria. They have a commission of inquiry very similar to the commission that I've been asked to preside uh, that has been working now for, uh, for a considerable time on Syria. So I, I don't think one can say that the UN has been indifferent to these other crises. There's a new video that surfaced today of you uh, basically mocking Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. Let me show it to you uh, first. Frankly, if I had to um, think of the, an individual who would be the greatest threat to the survival of Israel, um, I'd probably choose Netanyahu. <laughs> <laughs> you really have issues with Netanyahu, Mr. Shabas? I think that's probably a remark that I made at a conference in, uh, in Cleveland. And it was an answer to someone uh, who was attacking the Goldstone inquiry and who had said that Goldstone was the greatest threat, or I think was citing perhaps Netanyahu, saying that Goldstone was the greatest threat to the survival of Israel. Um, I think that's what I was doing, was taking up a, a statement that, uh, again, you've caught me a bit by surprise. I wasn't shown this and I haven't prepared for it. But that's my recollection. Well, you, you say that maybe Netanyahu is the biggest threat to the existence of Israel. Do you think after things like that and other comments of you uh, regarding Netanyahu personally, you could be a straight shooter in this? Well, I'm, I wasn't, I think, uh, asked to do this by the president of the Human Rights Council because of previous opinions or views. I was asked to do this because of my recognized expertise in international law. What I'm going to try to do is park my views at the door. Uh, I don't want to talk about them anymore. They're not relevant to the job I have to do. And I'm going to try and approach this as objectively and independently as I can. I, I think the critics, and obviously I'm on the tip of the iceberg on this, but I think that the, the critics of myself, um, they won't actually be happy with anyone the UN chooses. Um, they really are not content with the Commission. They'd like to see the Commission disappear. They don't really like the Human Rights Council at all. And I've been a bit of the lightning rod in the last few days to uh, attract that. But if I were to be removed from the picture, um, they'd still be just as vehement about whomever would replace me um, and about the Commission as a whole. You know that Hamas is listed uh, as a terrorist organization by your country, Canada. Do you have a problem with that? Uh, you know, I've been questioned about this before, about Hamas, and my views, I think, were, were greatly distorted, or my explanation was greatly distorted, including, by the way, by the Prime Minister, who was quoted as saying in the Jerusalem Post that I had taken the view that Hamas was not a terrorist organization. Of course, anyone who saw me on Israeli television last week um, knows that I never said any such thing. What I did, and I'm being very prudent on this, is I refused to take a position on anything at present in the politics of the region, because that is necessary to ensure my impartiality. People who expect me to take a position on Hamas want me to show that I'm not 
impartial. They want to distort the role that I have as an, as an impartial and independent commissioner. The but, uh, but Mr. Chavis, you're so cautious, really, not even to say that Hamas is a terrorist organization. At the same time, there are quotes of you saying quite terrible things about Netanyahu personally, and you have no problem with that. No, I have a problem with that because I have to draw a line between what I said before I was asked to do this job last week by the president of the Human Rights Council. People are quoting views that I said in the past. I said them. They're part of the public record. They were never mysterious. The president of the Human Rights Council knew them. The people in the United Nations know my views. There's no secret about them. Mr. William Shabis, I thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And here we are once again with Alon Pinkas, former advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak. Hello. Hello, Yaakov. And Barbara Pelrom, Defense News Bureau Chief in Israel. Hello, Barbara. Hi, Yaakov. Uh, we've just uh, saw the interview with uh, William Shabas Salon. Uh, can he be impartial? No. I'm sorry to say he, he could try all he wants and he could uh, uh, claim that it, things were taken out of context and were said in different circumstances. When you come to investigate, when you arrive uh, supposedly in an impartial way to investigate what happened in Gaza, and you are on record as saying the things he said about Israel and particularly about Prime Minister Netanyahu. He may be right, he may be wrong, that's in the eye of the beholder, but he can't be impartial. But well, should Israel cooperate with him at all? They should. Even though, exactly as Alone said, he cannot be impartial, uh, the uh, entire investigation will be structured as such that Israel will be uh, on the short end from the get-go. At least a lesson that uh, they should have learned from the cast lead operation is that go along, provide all your information, use it as a forum to um, counterattack and not allow the narrative to be hijacked by people that are obviously uh, not um, fair and objective. Alon, there's a train wreck over there. It's called U.S. Israeli relations. Yeah. Why? Uh, Traditionally, we divide any analysis of U.S.-Israeli relations into two uh, different uh, layers, the foundations or the structure of the relations and the personal relations. Uh, the personal relationship between Prime Minister Netanyahu and Obama is very bad. The, the, the amount of toxins that went into this relationship in the last five years is almost uh, impossible to overcome. If you take it in perspective, Mr. Netanyahu had a similar uh, bad relationship with President Clinton uh, during his first term in 96 to 99. Then we always made the claim that while personal relationships are important, uh, they never trickled down or permeated into the foundations. I think that now for the first time we are seeing, and, and th th there's a broader explanation for this, but I think we're seeing a trickling down or a penetration of the personal animosity and distrust between the two leaders into the structure of the relationship. Who's it's not bad, it's not that bad, it's, it's still solid, but there are cracks. Who's to blame, Berber? Well, here I have to comment on uh, what Alone said uh, about cracks in the institutional foundation of this relationship. This issue of uh, U.S. reassessment of its policy regarding arms transfers to Israel, it's a non-issue. Despite the credibility of the Wall Street Journal, this particular issue of the Hellfire missiles. But even raising this, uh, that hasn't happened in years. Leaks and um, using the press as um, a tool for setting agendas and um, venting sour grapes has always happened. You know that. But, but you're, you're saying that they did not stop any There shipments? is not a change in policy. And in fact, the policy, the procedure in the U.S. is such that unless the government actively intervenes. And less, by the way, these missiles were part of a December 2010 650 across the board arms package that the administration notified Congress of back after pillar of defense. Unless Congress actively votes to disapprove the sale, or unless the, uh, which it has only done once, I believe, in, in its history, and in, or unless the administration actively imposes a hold, as they did with Egypt, the process is on autopilot, Jacob. It's uh, f filling out the proper well, paperwork. We thought it was autopilot, but uh, we'll have to see about yeah. that. Let's watch a, a short uh, uh, excerpt of uh, President Obama interview with Tom Friedman of the New York Times. 
uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's poll numbers are a lot higher than mine, yeah. uh, <laughs> and and right. you know uh, we're greatly boosted by the, sure. the war on, uh, in Gaza, uh, and so if he doesn't feel some internal pressure, then it's hard to see him being willing to make some very difficult compromises, including taking on uh, the settler movement. Uh, that's a tough thing to do. Uh, with respect to Abbas, it's a slightly different problem. In some ways, Bibi's too strong. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, uh, uh, Abbas is too weak to uh, bring them together and make the kinds of bold uh, decisions that uh, a Sadat uh, or a Begin or a Rabin uh, uh, were willing to make. Alonno, it almost makes you cry. Well, yeah, let me just say two things. The, 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 the initial criticism of Mr. Obama, President Obama on this, was that he's trying to be a political pundit and a political analyst of the Israeli political system. I, I think it's deeper and, and, and more important than that. By saying that Mr. Netanyahu is too strong, he is casting the blame on Mr. Netanyahu. He's saying you could have and you chose not to. By saying that Mr. Abbas is too weak, he's basically saying uh, um, maybe you wanted to, but you couldn't. In other words, plague on both your houses. And that is not a pleasant statement. And As, it's be, be, uh, it uh, betrays his frustration with his failure correct. to make Netanyahu less dominating and Abbas correct. Um, strong. So how, however, it's however, let me. His own failure. Well, John Kerry's failure, but it doesn't matter. It's yeah, under it's his, his watch, he, and, his, and he, is, he is the president. He owns it, even though he stayed away from it. Mm -hmm. But there is one thing. When, when President Obama said to Tom Friedman, uh, Mr. Netanyahu's numbers are very high because of the war, uh, he was slightly premature. Uh, had he waited two, three weeks, we're, we're now on August uh, 17th, um, by the 1st of September, Mr. Netanyahu's numbers are going to be significantly lower. But How why? Why are they dropping? Because Israel did not go in and use even more what Israel calls decisive force and what the world perceives as excessive force. Perhaps. What Hillary Clinton thinks. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, this is what she uh, told Jeffrey Goldberg uh, in this uh, Atlantic interview. Yeah. And we're quoting. Great nations need organizing principles and don't do stupid stuff is not an organizing principle. Do you remember John McLaughlin used to shout this on yeah, Sunday yeah. shows? Well, what do you say? Obviously political par posturing on the part of Hillary Clinton. Uh, it was below the belt, uh, almost like an ambush. But, um, you know, the fact of, uh, that Hillary's policies, if she indeed gains the Democratic nomination and goes on to win, these are big ifs, the uh, presidential election, her policies on Israel are not likely to be any different or much different than Obama. In her book, ya uh, Yaakov, I really recommend you read it. I mean, she expressed her frustration. She called, she said that Netanyahu was stonewalling. She expressed frustration that Ehud Barak was unwilling to deliver the prime minister or the Israeli cabinet. And she talked about this November 2012 mm -hmm. meeting in the Regency Hotel in New York. It was the longest single bilateral meeting as secretary, where the prime minister extracted all kinds of, it was, it was really like blackmail almost, for a 90-day extension of the, the construction freeze. Maybe she just freeze. smells blood. No, I, well, I think she's, she's um, I, I agree with Barbara, it's political posturing. She's trying legitimately to distance herself from President Obama. Because she smells it, blood. But it could backfire on, on, on two uh, uh, levels. A, she's part of that. She was it's Secretary of, of State. Well, not a, no, no, I'm not saying there's a problem, but you can not You can criticize his health policy, his economic policy, you his immigration policy. his foreign policy. She's <laughs> not in a good position to criticize his foreign policy after serving four years as right. a Secretary of State. At this point, we'll say thank you to both of you. Is okay. that okay? Absolutely. Thank okay. you very much. We'll see you next Sunday. Dr. Ezzeldin Abulesh is a Palestinian, an extraordinary person who lost three daughters when an Israeli tank misfired and destroyed his home five years ago. It was the previous round in Gaza, but Dr. Abulesh said that he refused to hate and called for reconciliation. He since moved to Canada, uh, where he practices medicine, and now he's joining us from Toronto. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you. It's my pleasure. First of all, how's your life in uh, Canada? Light years from Gaza. Uh, but my life in Canada is part of my life in Gaza. I am Palestinian who was born, raised, living, lived in Gaza. But still, Gaza 
it's in my heart, it's in my soul, it moves with me, and I hope we all learn from Canada, which is a great country where the people, they understand each other, living in diversity, in respect, with understanding, in spite of the differences in languages, in color, but in living in harmony. You lost three daughters in Gaza five years ago uh, under similar circumstances to what's happening now. Why is this happening again? Uh, because, as Einstein said, insanity is to be doing the same thing and expecting a new result. The new result, it's more bloodshed, more animosity, more hatred, and to widen the gap between people. That's what is happening now. It's because we don't want to tackle the right problem, the right problem, which is the disease. It's not what is going on these days. Violence and conflict are a result of something, and they are not the cause. The cause, as you know, and everyone knows, and it became clear these days more than any time before, it's the occupation. You've said that uh, you refuse to hate despite your personal uh, tragedy. How do you convince people on both sides not to hate? What do you mean, which people? Both sides, on both sides. Both sides, I, I see it. Because you see the hatred and this time, it proved to me, as I believed in, hatred is a result of exposure. It's provoked, it's produced, and because of the exposure of the people to the life they are living in the Israeli side and the Palestinian side, they are endemic and living in hatred. And we need to tackle the root causes of this hatred which provoke this hatred. It's Palestinians, they are full of hatred because of what do they feel and what do they face every day from intimidation, humiliation, lack of freedom under oppression. And the Israelis, because of the incitement, what happened, even you see it, at the beginning they used to blame Palestinians. Palestinians are haters and they hate the Israelis. Now no one is free from hatred. Even the Israelis, they are full of anger, they are full of hatred, they are full of outrage. So we need the leaders. The leaders, in particular, I urge the Israeli leaders, the current Israeli leaders, it's time to be challenging, to take the risk. And I said it many times, violence and military means are futile and will never put an end to this conflict. It's only courage and to admit the rights of all. Dr. Ablesh, I thank you very much for your uh, very important voice. Thank you. Thank you. And this has been The World This Week here on I-24 News. We'll see you here next Sunday. Have a great week.